Well, viewer, it's that time of year again. The time of year when the leaves start to change, when corn maize participation goes up by like 500%, black cats start getting hate crimed, and film YouTubers start thinking, shit, I should have started planning a Halloween video months ago. Full disclosure, I had a couple different ideas for a Halloween video this year. My first was to watch every single R.L. Stein adaptation, and while I still think that that's a fun concept, I quickly realized that I would need like a full year to accomplish that, not a couple months. It's my goblet. Then I thought maybe I could fast track my The Wrong Lifetime Movies video because, you know, they're thrillers, that's kind of spooky themed, but I've hit a bit of a wall there because there are several films on the list that I genuinely cannot find anywhere, like legally or otherwise. So if anyone out there knows where I could get my hands on digital copies of The Wrong Stepfather, The Wrong Fiance, the Wrong Mr. Right, The Wrong Prince Charming, The Wrong Valentine, The Wrong Blind Date, or The Wrong High School Sweetheart, I would be much obliged. If it were one or two of the movies, I might feel okay just leaving them out, but that's a big chunk of the series right there. Omitting that many movies from a breakdown of The Wrong series would just feel, for lack of a better word, wrong. So in lieu of either of those ideas, I recently remembered that I'd been meaning to explore a certain subgenre of horror thrillers, a subgenre known for its melodrama, its camp, its grisly subjects and imagery, the ridiculous syntax of its titles, and most of all, it's old ladies. I'm speaking, of course, of the psycho bitty genre. It's also known as the hag exploitation genre, hag horror, and occasionally the Grand Dame Guignol genre. Named for La Théâtre du Grand Guignol, or the Theater of the Great Puppet, a Parisian theater known for its grisly horror plays like La Laboratoire des Hallucinations, A Crime dans une Maison de Fou, Le Baiser dans la Nuit, and, of course, L'Horrible Passion. That's a favorite of mine. Still, I prefer the name Psycho Biddy. There's just something about it. The name alone is already so incredibly camp. The Psycho Biddy film refers to a subgenre that arose following the release of the 1962 film Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, No Relation, directed by Robert Aldrich. Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, a psychological thriller starring two Hollywood Golden Age actresses, Betty Davis and Joan Crawford, was immensely popular upon its release and in the years since for its suspense, camp, and the real-life rivalry between the two leads. The success of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane led to a slew that pun will be funny later, of similar films, all horror thrillers, all starring aging Hollywood starlets, and often with outlandish titles, usually featuring a woman's name. You've heard of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, now get ready for Hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte, Whatever Happened to Aunt Alice, What's the Matter with Helen, and my personal favorite, Whoever slew Auntie Rue. The past tense slew is my new favorite thing. Auntie Rue, she didn't slay. She slew. I think the Psycho Biddy film has a really interesting place in film history and representations of gender in cinema. Psycho Biddy films were a product of several filmic predecessors. In some ways, they're a subversion of the women's film of the 1940s and 50s, like if you took a Douglas Sirk melodrama and sold its soul to the devil. On top of that, the morbidity and exploitative nature of these films were likely in some part a response to the interest in that type of story following the success of Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. And despite the common criticism that this genre demeaned these older actresses and made a mockery of their careers and reputations, I think there's something kind of empowering about it. If you were an older actress in the 1960s, you were probably receiving few offers for roles, and the ones you were receiving were probably the docile mother, the docile aunt, the old spinster. In a way, Psycho Biddy films were one of the only sources of meaty, interesting roles for aging actresses at the time, and I think women like Betty Davis and Joan Crawford, as the first ones to really do this, going out on a limb and trying something so new and decidedly unflattering 
flattering was rather courageous of them. I thought it might be fun to go through the most quintessential psycho bitty titles and review them, show you the funniest bits, etc. And who better to do it than me, a 21 year old who's starting to find gray hairs. At this rate, I'll be a psycho bitty myself before the release of Avatar 2. So without further ado, let's find out who slew Auntie Rue. Spoiler alert that will hopefully make you want to watch the whole video, it may or may not have been the child actor from Oliver. Bloody good fire. <laughs> We simply can't unpack the psycho bitty genre without covering the OG, the blueprint, the original hags that got exploited. The film follows two aging sisters, the elder Baby Jane Hudson, a former child star, and the younger Blanche, a former film actress who found success as an adult. Years ago, at the height of her fame, Blanche was in a car accident, ostensibly caused by Jane, that rendered her paraplegic, and Jane has been caring for her ever since while the resentment grows between them. It was based on a novel of the same name by Henry Farrell, and I think its best attributes by far are its characters and the dynamic between the two sisters. It's just really good drama, the rivalry between these two, especially having Jane have been more successful when they were children, but being eclipsed by Blanche in adulthood. You really understand understand why they hate each other so much, but also why they continue to put up with each other. And of course, it's all served with such a hefty dose of camp. Is there a more iconic Betty Davis look, one imitated in drag, more than this one? But you are, Blanche! You are in that chair! This only intensifies when Victor Buono's character is introduced. If you don't come from a Perry Mason obsessed family like I do, you might not know Victor Buono, but he was a great character actor who appeared in many films and TV shows, often playing much older than his age. This was his film debut, and I think he was only around 24 in it, which is hard to wrap your head around. He plays a struggling composer and pianist who responds to an ad put out by Jane, who's seeking an accompanist to try and revive her childhood act. I've written a letter to Daddy. His address is heaven above. Buono's character and the character's mother are somehow on another level of camp. The ham is off the charts. And this also yields one of my favorite quotes in the film. You must have guessed that I'm English. Oh, really? How nice for you. But in its more serious moments, the film feels a bit like a modern gothic tale. A lot of these films do. Many of them feature decrepit old mansions and dark family secrets, epic tragedy, characters being haunted by the past. Probably my biggest gripe with this film is just that it's quite long and feels pretty slow. I don't think this would be an issue for everyone, nor do I think it's objectively bad or anything. I just found myself wishing at times for a little more editing. But it's well crafted and features one of the best endings of any of these films. It's very haunting and it's gone down in history as a really famous sequence. This film also introduces a detail that I noticed was present in many of these films, which is milk. I can't explain it, but people in these movies drink a lot of milk. I'm tempted to say it's just that people used to drink more milk in those days, but I, I watch other old movies and I feel like there's not always this much milk drinking. This point will be better illustrated as I go on. Dead Ringer is another Betty Davis star from two years after Baby Jane. The film sees Davis in a double role, playing twins Margaret and Edith. The sisters have a bitter past as Margaret essentially stole Edith's man out from under her by fake baby trapping him. So Margaret got the guy and went on to be a rich socialite while Edith is down on her luck with nothing but a failing cocktail bar and a cop boyfriend. So like anyone would do in this situation, she murders her twin, swaps their identities, and makes it look like a suicide. Now Sit down! My biggest issue with this film is that it is not what it claims to be. This is not a horror film. It's not even really a thriller film. I would call it a pretty straightforward noir. If this had been released in like 1944, it would 100% just be labeled a noir. And maybe that's how it was envisioned, but 
having a somewhat dark story starring Betty Davis made them want to try and cash in on the success of whatever happened to Baby Jane with the marketing, that's all I can imagine. I don't think it's a bad movie, I just would not go into it expecting something similar to most other films in this genre, and I'm not sure why it's frequently lumped in with these other films. I wonder if some of the curators of these lists like haven't even seen it and just throw it in there because of its time period and its star. So consider this my expose of Dead Ringer starring Betty Davis. Not a true psycho biddy, just an early neo-noir that happens to star Betty Davis. Um, milk moment? At one point in this film, Betty mentions serving a guy a drink of whiskey and milk? Whiskey and milk. Madam gave it to him the night he died. What were you guys on in the 60s? Besides, you know, whiskey and milk. Okay, now we're getting into it. Straight Jacket stars Joan Crawford as a one-time axe murderer, but remember kids, it only takes one time. Yes, Joan Crawford axe murdered her husband and his lover and was sent away to the sanatorium, and 20 years later she is deemed fit to be released and reconnects with her now adult daughter. But uh-oh, somebody's axe murdering again, and they really want you to think it's Joan Crawford. This is a William Castle film. If you don't know William Castle, he was a producer and director known for making cheap gimmick horror B-movies. I'm William Castle, and uh... Uh, this wheelchair is just to rest my tired nerves after producing a picture like this one. He once offered life insurance policies to each audience member in case they should die of fright during the film. He would make the seats vibrate to emulate the tingler. For 13 ghosts, they'd give you special glasses that would make the ghosts in the film visible. In House on Haunted Hill, he would rig a skeleton to come out and fly over the audience during a scene with a skeleton. For those of us on lower budgets, we just have to have them hanging limply off of the bed. For one of his movies, he had two different endings and he would have the audience vote during the movie on whether they wanted the main character to live or die. <laughs> I think that one is iconic. I think all movies should do that. Anyway, this film is sadly devoid of a gimmick, but it's still very recognizable as a castle film in its B-movie camp, certainly in its ending, which I'm going to spoil, so skip to here if you're planning to watch Straight Jacket right after this. In the end, it turns out that Joan Crawford's daughter has been committing the murders and gaslighting her mother into thinking that she did it, but the way she did this is she dressed up as Joan Crawford, and put on a Mission Impossible style hyper-realistic rubber face mask. So you get this glorious moment where Joan Crawford is wrestling with a second Joan Crawford. By the way, the in-universe explanation for how and why the daughter had this mask is that she is a talented sculptor. So I guess that translates to hyper-realistic mask production. As stupid as this film is, it does have some credibility in that it was written by Robert Bloch, who wrote the original novel that Psycho is based on. This is interesting because before this, William Castle actually made a film that was very transparently ripping off Psycho, a film called Homicidal. A special interval will be provided during the running of this picture for refunding your admission. If you're unable to stand the almost unbearable suspense, the almost paralyzing shock of homicidal. I have seen Homicidal, and I would recommend it. Probably one of the craziest, stupidest plot twists I have ever seen. But I guess that didn't offend Robert Bloch, and um, he wrote the scripts for several horror B-movies around the 60s and 70s, so maybe it was just like another day at the office for him. There is milk in this one. I know I haven't established a drinking game for this video, but you know, drink for milk. So this is the actual follow-up to Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. This one is by the same director and is based on a short story by the same author as the novel Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. In Hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte, Betty Davis plays a southern belle turned spinster, 
As a young girl, she was having an affair with a married man who had his head and hand cut off at a ball, and it's kind of assumed that Charlotte did it, despite never having been convicted of it. Charlotte's decrepit plantation house is on the verge of foreclosure, so she summons her cousin, played by Olivia de Havion, who is seemingly trying to make Charlotte think that she's going crazy so that she and her lover, Joseph Cotton, can steal her wealth. And there's no twist. It's just kind of what you expect it to be and stays that way for the entire time. I found this one to be one of the slowest. It's a little like those Lifetime movies that I criticize that show you exactly what's going on right at the beginning and leave no room for mystery. The difference between this and Baby Jane is that in that film, even though we know that Jane is the antagonist the whole time, the characters and the dynamic between the characters is what's entertaining. Plus, even though it's not really a story-altering twist, there is a revelation at the end that recontextualizes the whole thing, and you see that even though Jane was the aggressor for most of the film, both of these women are profoundly resentful and bitter and have done terrible things. All this time we could have been friends. In Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, the plot is just one note, and though Davis is giving it her all, Haviond is just a little bland. She just seems like a normal, if scheming, lady. Not much camp or depth there. And it's so long. It's as long as Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, but with like a fifth of the actual content. I like that Victor Buono is in it, even if it's for a tragically short time. I like this Degrassi, you're just jealous moment. You're just jealous because Miss Charlotte always favored me. Shut up! She's jealous. I like this dream fantasy sequence. It's definitely the most interesting part of the film. And I like this moment when Olivia de Havilland is just slapping Betty Davis over and over again. It's pretty funny. <laughs> But yeah, not the level of entertainment value I want out of my psycho bitty picture. Certainly one of our most creative titles. And that's saying something. Die, Die, My Darling, or Fanatic, the title it was released under in Britain, stars a new psycho biddy, Tallulah Bankhead, as a religious fanatic who kidnaps her dead son's ex-fiance so that she can die a virgin and join the son in heaven. It's that kind of thing. I enjoyed this premise. It's a lot less cookie cutter than most of the stuff we've seen so far. This is our first Hammer horror film on this list. If you don't know, Hammer is a British production company best known for their slew of relatively low-budget horror mystery thriller films in the 1960s and 70s. I really love Hammer films. They tend to be very campy, not usually particularly scary, more like spooky. They're great films for Halloween. Most of these films were in color, and they really took advantage of that technology. There's usually a lot of vivid, garish lighting and sets and props. They also tended to do a lot of gothic horror films, or at least period horror films, so it's really fun to put on a Hammer horror film and be transported to this almost childish, spooky Victorian Halloween atmosphere. But they also employed a lot of genuinely talented actors like Vincent Price and Peter Cushing. And Tallulah Bankhead is really good in Fanatic. Hers was one of my favorite performances in all of these films. It's very psycho and very bitty. Despite the film being fairly silly, it seems like she really threw herself into it, which I respect a lot. She put her whole Tallussy into it. I both wrote that and expected my future self to say it. Donald Sutherland also plays a minor role in this, one of his very first film roles, and honestly, he's really fun to watch. Pretty. It's a potentially offensive role, but he's somehow very likable and entertaining. Also, it's not exactly a milk moment, but it's related and very funny. At one point, one of Tallulah's servants has a moment to himself, and he cuts a huge block of cheese off of this even huger block of cheese and just starts eating it, like just taking bites out of it. It's so much cheese. Like, no disrespect at all. You know, I wish I had the courage to move about the world with this much carefree joie de vie but like, is this something British people do? And on top of that, there is a good milk moment. I'm afraid I- Milk? Please. I think this might also be our first film with a title drop. You must die. Die, my darling. So that was exciting. I'd call this one of the more entertaining films on the list. It's very out there and full of surprising moments.
Berserk, starring Joan Crawford, is not a Hammer horror film, but you could have fooled me. Sorry. It is a British film, and it definitely has the Hammer look. In Berserk, Crawford plays a cold and calculating circus manager. A circus murder mystery begins when the tightrope walker's rope is cut, and somehow, instead of just falling to his death, he gets tangled in the rope in such a specific way that he is hanged. Yeah, I don't really understand it either. But basically the detectives are like, hmm, I wonder if this could have involved foul play. This film is not that entertaining, or fun, or scary, but it does get a little interesting when it comes to the circus stuff. Because the thing is, this being set in a circus, they hired presumably real circus performers and used a presumably real circus, and at times the movie just stops and plays out an entire filmed circus performance. It makes sense for the stuff that's related to the plot, like the tightrope walking, but at one point we just see this entire elephant routine. Or this woman's entire trained poodle act, which was actually pretty impressive. But it's also rather uncomfortable because because seeing all these trained elephants and whatnot doing these incredible circus feats is a big reminder that just a little while ago we just did that to elephants on the reg. It's a little different for the poodles, you know, they're basically just doing the types of things you see in dog shows, and it's normal for people to train dogs to do tricks, but the elephants are just depressing to watch. Anyway, I imagine it was very tempting to throw all of these acts into the film because it's a pretty easy way to both set your circus scene and really pad out your runtime. Probably only like a third of this film is plot, and the plot is not very compelling. I know a lot of these films have flimsy plots, but this one is quite bare bones. I'm just gonna spoil it for you, the killer ends up being Joan Crawford's daughter, I guess these writers saw Straight Jacket, but the daughter is only introduced very late in the film. And I feel like that's a weird thing to do in a whodunit. She gives a very weak, unsatisfying speech about why she did it. I had to kill them all! I had to destroy your circus! So without a good plot, or much of anything else, I think my favorite part of this film was the circus company? I'm not talking about the random, unnamed people who came out to do the real circus acts. I mean the film's principal, named circus performer characters who round out the ensemble cast. I like this scene where they're all discussing how distressed they are at the thought of a murderer on the loose in the circus, and they kind of all have their little moment to express emotions relevant to their roles in the circus. I am stronger than two horses. You all know that when I bend an iron bar with my teeth, it is for real. Iron. But even I cannot fight what I cannot see. I'm so scared I can hear my bones rattle. Then, in the most bizarre scene in the entire movie, everyone's at a party, and suddenly they're like, okay, the circus performers are going to sing now. And now, ladies and gentlemen, a big surprise. A number from our own group. And in perfectly choreographed fashion, they just sing an entire musical number. We see the whole thing. Again, it's like the movie just stops to let this happen. Attend a mass ball, fall in love with your partner, it might be me. And it's so unintentionally funny and weird because for one thing, we keep cutting back to the other characters watching and they're all smiling like this is the most beautiful, charming thing they've ever seen in their lives. And almost the entire performance is just this stationary, straight on wide shot. And for the most part, instead of cutting to close-ups, they just have characters individually take turns walking up to the camera and playing directly to it. Walk in the park, hear a voice in the dark, and it might be me. I think this belongs in a museum. I think all movies should have a moment where the characters do this. This is how I look when I'm watching these movies. From the title of this film, you can probably tell it's from the same producer as Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. It's not based on the work of the same author, though. It's based on the novel The Forbidden Garden by Ursula Curtis. Whatever Happened to Aunt Alice stars Geraldine Page as Claire Marable, a vain and rude woman who discovers after her husband's death that he was not as rich as she thought, and he's actually squandered their money and left her destitute. So as an alternative money-making option, a side hustle, if you will, she begins murdering her housekeepers after conning them out of all of their money and planting pine trees over their graves. And you would do it too for a check. 
I'm not sure why she chose housekeepers. There can only be so much money there. I feel like it'd be much more straightforward to just find some wealthy older gentleman and go the Black Widow route, but I guess that's not as original a concept. So in this film, we actually get two biddies for the price of one, Geraldine Page and Ruth Gordon. Only one of them is a psycho biddy, though. Ruth Gordon just plays a regular biddy. Gordon plays Claire's latest housekeeper, Alice, who is actually undercover. She's come to investigate the disappearance of her friend, who was Claire's previous housekeeper, whom she murdered. I think the best thing about this film is Geraldine Page's performance. She is a real class act. She was only in her early 40s in this. She's playing quite a bit older. And Ruth Gordon is also really good. It's enjoyable to watch the two of them. I wouldn't say this film has the interesting psychological elements of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane or Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, but the restraint of those films is there. It's not as wacky or exploitative as Straight Jacket or Berserk. There's also this moment where Gordon takes down Claire using a wheelchair as a weapon, which I thought was a fun callback to Baby Jane, intentional or not. I think this film is lacking in thrills. It's also lacking in a good climax. It gets a little muddled towards the end. I also don't think the final line of the film is quite the serve they thought it was. After all, I'd make a very handsome pine tree. However, I do appreciate Chekhov's Labrador Retriever. There's a Labrador Retriever in the film who's a nuisance to Claire early on and then ends up bringing about her downfall. Good for you, Spike the dog actor. And I'm not gonna be your next victim! <laughs> I take back anything I said about any other title. This is my favorite title on the list. I laugh every time I read it. And that's right, plot twist, a male psycho biddy. I feel like we need a separate moniker for these, you know, the psycho geezer genre. Psycho Fogey. The Psycho Fogey in question is actually THE Psycho Fogey, horror legend and gay icon Mr. Anthony Perkins himself. Now here's the thing. Yes, this is a film about a man, which some might argue disqualifies it from being included in this genre. And yes, Anthony Perkins was only like 37 when this was made, and pretty much still in a successful period in his career, which some might argue does not really put him in the same category as the aging starlets of Hollywood's golden age, typical of the psycho biddy genre. However, I would argue that the naming convention of this film's title, as well as the involvement of Curtis Harrington as director, he also directed psycho biddy classics What's the Matter with Helen and Whoever Slew Auntie Rue, and the film's source material, a novel by the same author as Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, Whatever Happened to Cousin Charlotte, the basis for the film Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte, and the screenplay for What's the Matter with Helen more than qualifies it for at least an honorary place in the psycho biddy canon. So, now that we have that out of the way, How Awful About Alan is a television film about Alan, a man with psychosomatic blindness caused by a house fire that killed his father, that he says he inadvertently started, but it does sound pretty suspicious. You know the fire was accidental. You didn't leave the paint cans and thinner next to the heater deliberately that night. After being released from the mental hospital, that happens a lot in these movies, he starts living with his sister who suffered a facial burn in the fire and now wears a prosthetic to hide the scar. His sister starts renting out one of their spare rooms to a student, and Alan starts to hear suspicious things and thinks that something fishy is going on with this lodger and his sister and whatever. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't really get this one. I wanted to like it because I love Anthony Perkins and I love this title, but it's not all that scary, it's not all that funny, and it's not even really clear what's happening a lot of the time. I haven't read the book, this could be a result of the adaptation, but I found myself wondering at times, like, why does this exist? Why are we watching this story? What's the point of it? At the end, it's revealed that Alan's sister has been gaslighting him with the end goal of trying to kill him because she's mad that he killed their father, 
but you never really get a good idea of why the sister would feel so defensive of their father or why that's an interesting or compelling thing. We know that the dad was abusive to Alan, but they don't really go any deeper into that with either sibling character. And then, despite Alan finally regaining his sight during this struggle with his sister, at the very end of the film he starts to lose it again, and that's like our ending stinger. But why? What is that supposed to insinuate? It's not a twist, it's just confusing. One thing that was keeping me engaged and really making me laugh is that every time Alan hears these mysterious voices calling his name, I was so reminded of that scene in Jurassic Park 3 when Alan has a dream that a velociraptor says his name. Alan. Alan. And oh boy. That was funny to recall. Yeah, I was really hoping that this would be the funniest one, but it was not. I guess watch it if you want to see Anthony Perkins walking around in his huge cable knit fisherman sweater. I did enjoy that. We're on to a heavy hitter here. This was actually the first of these films I watched about a month ago, and the one that made me want to do a whole deep dive. Whoever slew Auntie Rue is sort of a Hansel and Gretel retelling about two young orphans, Oliver Twist and a girl, who go to a wealthy older woman, Shelley Winter's Auntie Rue's house for Christmas. Auntie Rue has a tradition of hosting a lavish Christmas party at her house every year for all of the orphan children. She seems like a nice lady, but she's actually keeping the mummified corpse of her dead daughter in her house and regularly tries to contact her in seances. <laughs> And when she meets Girl, Oliver's little sister, she notes a resemblance between her and her dead daughter, so she essentially kidnaps her so that she can keep her as a daughter. It's not really clear why she doesn't just adopt her officially. Like, she is an orphan, and Auntie Rue doesn't actually seem to really have ulterior motives. She appears to just want to make the girl her new daughter. I guess it would take too long for her liking. Maybe Auntie Rue isn't a fan of bureaucratic formalities. Anyway, from the beginning, Oliver doesn't trust Rue. He thinks she's the evil witch trying to eat them or whatever. So he gets himself involved, and eventually we have this whole kerfuffle between Auntie Rue and these two kids. Mark Lester's performance is pretty funny in this. He is extremely cute. Um, he did not go on to act in his adulthood. I can't imagine why. They shoved the wicked witch into the fire and slammed the bolt on the oven door. I promise never to run away again. So do I. There are lots of bizarre moments in this film that make for a very enjoyable viewing experience. Shelley Winters is just giving it everything. Mm, mm. Mm. It is a period film, so it really has that Hammer-type Victorian horror ambiance. I love the inherent camp of Shelley Winters keeping a tiny child coffin in a secret room in her house. I love that the film tries to be ambiguous about whether Auntie Rue is actually dangerous or not, but kind of fails to communicate anything clearly. I love that this movie ends with these two kids literally burning Shelley Winters alive. Bloody good fire. I guess in the end, they really did slay. I would recommend this film to everyone. It's a great Halloween movie, it's technically a Christmas movie, and essential viewing for anyone like myself who owns the Oliver soundtrack on vinyl. We don't ask that often enough. You know, what is the matter with Helen? In What's the Matter with Helen, Debbie Reynolds and Shelley Winters play Adele and Helen, the mothers of two men who have just been imprisoned for murder who decide to start new lives in California, running a dance studio for little girls trying to be the next Shirley Temple. This is all taking place in the 1930s. They find themselves seemingly being stalked by someone who wants revenge for the person murdered by their sons, and it all kind of unravels from there. What's the Matter with Helen is another one by Curtis Harrington, director of How Awful About Alan and Whoever Slew Auntie Rue. To his credit, there is a lot of subtext in What's the Matter with Helen. In fact, subtext might even be putting it lightly. 
According to Shelley Winters, she was aware of the potential lesbian aspect of her character and did try to play it that way, despite pressure from the studio to omit that part of the film. So it's never explicit, but it is very easy to read Helen as being in love with Adele. She gets very jealous as soon as Adele starts a relationship with the father of one of their students. The incredibly southern, incredibly hot father of one of their students. Well, all that Bible punching, that, uh... <laughs> That'll get you in the end. I'm sorry, I don't know why I liked this guy so much. I think this actor was rather famous on TV. He was on Gunsmoke and McLeod, two shows I have never watched. But man, his mustache and his simple, self-assured country boy charm. I was just enraptured every time he was on screen. You want to marry me? Well, I'll tell you something. I'm crazy about you. I will marry you too. I really love all of the supporting characters in this. Everyone is so high camp and high drama. There's this elocution tutor, Hamilton Starr, who proposes partnering with the two women, combining their businesses, teaching little girls the performing arts, and he's played by this really over-the-top actor and impresario. You should have rung the bell. I hate to spoil an entrance, I'm afraid. This guy's real life was crazy, by the way. He was English, but as a young man, he moved to Ireland, changed his name, and made up this backstory that he was a native Irishman. He just adopted a completely new identity as a fake Irish person. He was also gay. So gay and so well-respected that he and his partner were once described as Ireland's only publicly acknowledged homosexuals. Can you imagine? He was so fake Irish and so gay that the Dublin Gay Theatre Festival has an award named after him. Basically what I'm trying to say is that we are very lucky to be blessed with his presence in this film, and it is not wasted. Oh, I admit I am subject to the disease of curiosity. Now, where do we discuss these sordid business details? Then there are all of these little girls stage mothers, some of them themselves played by famous actresses of old Hollywood. I really like the backdrop of the children's song and dance studio in this film. It's very camp and entertaining in a proto-toddlers and tiaras kind of way. And it's also interesting in its self-referentiality. Referentiality is a word, I looked it up. The film taking place in the 1930s and lampooning this exploitative side of show business calls attention to the fact that we're watching these icons of Hollywood's golden age past the peak of their careers and pre-Halloween Town franchise. It's impossible to ignore the context of the genre while watching this caricature of the sort of people who will do anything to make it in pictures. They're very interested in Rosalie at RKO. Oh, that's wonderful, Mrs. Greenbaum. <laughs> she could make you famous. Yes, well, I bet she will. It's like this metatextual reading of the very act of making these films with these actresses. It's not the central theme of the film, but it's a very fascinating and fitting thing, especially to bookend our viewing with. This was one of my favorite films on the list. I think its strengths are its tone, its performances, its style and characters. But I'd say my main issue is with the story. Throughout the film, it seems obvious that Helen is the crazy one and Adele is the normal one. Now, they both ultimately do immoral things, but in the end, this initial impression is basically only reinforced. Helen is the one who has the breakdown and resorts to violence, while Adele seems more like the sane, if desperate, protagonist. And I kept hoping that that wouldn't be the case. I really wanted the film to subvert that. Because here you have Adele, a beautiful, charming, talented woman who enters into a nice, successful romantic relationship with a man. A very hot, southern man. She has the obstacle of her son being a murderer, and there's a little bit of vague allusion to a potential rift with an ex-husband, but she doesn't get much of a backstory, and either way it doesn't seem to hamper her very much. And then you have Helen, not presented as conventionally attractive, not framed as desirable like Adele, plain, frumpy, gay-coded, haunted by a traumatic event in her past, unaware of trends and popular culture, lacking the social skills that seem to come so naturally to Adele. I found Helen so much easier to identify with than Adele, and I don't know what that says about me, but I thought it was intentional. 
And knowing that these films so often center around a principal othered character who seems to be going crazy but is actually being gaslit or manipulated by a more outwardly palatable character, it seemed like a bit of a no-brainer to have a twist where actually Adele is behind any nefariousness and Helen has been innocent all along. But this film came out 51 years ago and Curtis Harrington has been dead since 2007, so... What we see is what we get. I guess I was wishing that the narrative had had more empathy for Helen, the way I was feeling empathy for Helen. It wouldn't just be a kinder narrative, but in my opinion, a more interesting one. Maybe nothing's the matter with Helen. Maybe something's the matter with the rest of us. Horror at its roots is an exploration of otherness. It forces us to question humanity and the world as we know it. Why is the unknown so frightening? Why do we find vampires so goddamn sexy? And why does a formerly glamorous woman attempting to be sexually desirable, despite having passed the socially acceptable age at which to do so, make us so uncomfortable? Were these films a cheap, sleazy way to prey on a desperate class of struggling performers, or were they a brave new endeavor for women who were previously only being offered roles as mothers, aunts, school teachers? I don't know, but I would like to believe it's a little of both. On the one hand, most of these films are undeniably exploitative, but on the other, no one forced anyone to participate, and these did breathe new life into the careers of women like Betty Davis, Joan Crawford, and Shelley Winters, and placed them in the types of roles they'd never played before. I'm sure it's not for everyone, but in my book, it's better to be remembered as a psycho biddy than no biddy at all. I actually made you a little template to find out what your psycho biddy title would be. I came up with 12 phrases, one for each month of the year, and 31 old-fashioned names for the days of the month. I did throw one man's name in there in honor of Alan. You just plug in your birthday. So, for example, mine would be, my god, they've sloon Gwendolyn. <laughs> if you're happy with your results, do feel free to comment what you got. Happy Halloween to this guy and this guy only. And subscribe to my YouTube channel if you don't want me to bury you out back and plant a pine tree over your grave. Subscribe to my YouTube channel or die, die my darling. Subscribe to my YouTube channel if you would like to be Ireland's only publicly acknowledged homosexual.